Thank you all for coming. And today I'm very excited that we are going to hear about a citizen science project that is about to launch um, next week. You will see this actually in the news. And um, we have uh, one of the founders of this project here, Michael Hardinger. Um, Michael is a space scientist um, who got his PhD in UCLA and now is at, I want to say the Space Science Institute, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, but he also works on um, uh, geomagnetically induced currents and um, waves in the magnetosphere and ionosphere and is starting this citizen science project so that people can listen to some of the waves and might notice um, new phenomena there. So it's a great story and we're really happy to have you here, Michael. Um, feel free to come on camera if you're able to and share your slides. Hopefully that will all work. Sure, um, yeah, so hopefully you can hear me and thanks mm -hmm. for having me. Um, I will try to share my sc screen right now. And I'm gonna share with sound. I don't know how well it's gonna work because Zoom is always kind of finicky, but I think I've configured it to do the right thing. Um, let me see if I can make this full screen. Yeah, so just um, for, first of all, thanks for having me uh, and um, really excited to talk to this group, really excited to talk to all of you who are doing fantastic science um, with the Aurora. And um, I want to also say sorry for on, on behalf of Martin who couldn't make it. Uh, he's on UK time. So this is, and also I think he's on vacation this week or, or just coming back from vacation. So he couldn't make it, but um, I will do my best to talk about some of the stuff he, he worked on that um, kind of preceded this project. And um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge him as well as uh, the support from NASA for this project, uh, which is a NASA Citizen Science Seed Funding Grant and many co-authors um, and, and members of the HARP team. And I'll, and I'll plug this throughout the talk, but this is our website, wisdom.spacescience.org. And I'll get into a little more about how, if, if you all are interested, how you can help us and also how we can potentially work together on some science related to the Aurora. So I'm gonna see if I can make this full screen. And I'll swap this around. So hopefully that's a little better. It's over here. And yeah, and just jump in anytime um, uh, if you have any questions. And already I've gotten some excellent feedback from Aura, who has now um, let me know that you can tap dance to the sounds of space. So I'm gonna be trying to work that into later seminars. But I guess um, what I'll be talking about is, as was mentioned is uh, how we can use um, uh, satellite measurements turned into sound to learn more about what's happening in our space environment near Earth and, and beyond. And um, let me go to the next slide. And let me see if I can move this Zoom thing out of the way. I guess you can't see that, so that's fine. So yeah, I'll start, I'm just gonna start with a question. Um, why don't heliophysics researchers use audio analysis? So why don't the people who are studying um, the charged particles and magnetic fields that are around the sun and throughout the solar system why don't, why don't we, we use audio analysis um, in our research? Um, because we use visual analysis um, basically exclusively. Um, when we look at measurements and we design our, our, our computer algorithms to look at different patterns. So why don't we use audio analysis? So I'm gonna actually ask a different question. Why did we stop using audio analysis? Um, so we have these waves in magnetic, in, in magnetic fields and charged particles or plasma uh, in near space and beyond, you know, on the sun, in the solar wind out you know, around various planets. So they're, they're everywhere in our solar system and beyond. And you know, we didn't always um, use exclusively visual analysis to look at these things. So when you, um, when you listen to some plasma waves, um, they have frequencies in the human audible range. So you can actually hear them if you have like an antenna uh, and you play it through a speaker and I'm just going to play one example of something called a Whistler wave um, detected by a, a, a NASA satellite called POR. If I can get this to work. So let's stop it there. Hopefully that didn't blow out your eardrums. I forgot to warn people. <laughs> Sometimes you have to adjust the audio. 
um, to, to hear those things. It might be too faint or too loud, but hopefully you heard uh, what we call a whistler wave um, detected uh, in the space environment around Earth. And um, we, we named this thing, we named it a whistler wave based on that sound. And the same is true for other waves, chorus, whistlers, hiss, and other, there's other examples of it too. So in the early phase of heliophysics research, when we were just starting to learn about these things and put names to them, we were doing this research using speakers, using audified um, measurements of things like magnetic fields and electric fields. We don't do that anymore. Even though we still use these names, we basically never use audio as a research tool. We do, we do visual analysis um, to help us design a computer algorithm and so on. And there's a few exceptions to that, but you know, very ex almost exclusively we're using visual. We do use audio, of course, for public outreach. People really enjoy listening to these sounds. And I was, I was just talking to Laura about how we have some people composing music with them and using them in dance and, and so on, but we don't use it for research. And, and that's really what we're trying to do uh, with the HARP project. Oops, go there. So what I'm talking about specifically, there's, there's many different types of these waves in, in plasmas. Um, what I'm specifically talking about are sort of the lowest frequency waves in the nearest space environment. These are um, what we call ultra low frequency waves. And um, at the, these kinds of low frequencies, these are, these are really massive waves. They're filling up the whole um, near Earth space environment. Um, this is the cavity that the, the Earth's magnetic field carves out in the solar wind that we call the magnetosphere. And um, basically, if you look at the types of waves you can get um, that we've detected from satellites and ground-based measurements, there's a pretty close analogies to musical instruments. There are waves that exist on the boundary, like waves on a drum. There's waves that exist throughout the cavity, like you'd get in a wind instrument, uh, like a flute or a clarinet. And there's waves um, on the magnetic field lines, like just like the plucked waves of a string. And in fact, that exact analogy has been used to study these, um, these types of plasma waves. And there's analogies you can make also to a harp um, where you have many different many field line strings with different lengths that you get different pitches. And I'll, I'll make that um, analogy even more uh, clear later in the talk. But um, yeah, there's just a very close analogy with, with the types of waves that we get in the near space environment and uh, musical instruments. And our challenge, um, we, we kind of have a good idea of the different instruments that you can get um, in the near space environment. But what we can't really do is predict the exact combinations of the different pitches and different types of waves you'll get when all these things are playing together at the same time. And it, this is particularly true during um, uh, geomagnetic storms where they're often all playing at the same time and they're all also retuning as you know the, the, the magnetosphere is basically expanding and contracting and plasma is moving around. So this is very complicated. We call, we're calling it like a cacophony of different things playing at the same time and changing. And that's what we need to unravel. And that's the really the open question, where a lot of the open questions are in this, in this research area. So we've been using sound to study these waves. And it's really something that we're using as a tool, just another tool in our kit to help us um, look at these different patterns and kind of pick apart the different um, co complex but repeatable patterns that can occur in your space environment. So there's a lot of advantages of human, the human auditory system and human hearing um, they're not, it's not like one is better than the other, like hearing is better than, than our, than our eyes, but they just complement each other and they're good at looking at different patterns. And, um, so what we do, uh, when we audify is we, um, we speed up the data because our, our waves that we're looking at are very low frequency. So we speed up the data, um, where basically you have one year and it gets contracted down to six minutes. And there's a lot more detail I can go into in exactly, you know, what rate you'd speed up and other things you can do with audio analysis to, to tune you know, to, to the type of thing that you're studying. But the bottom line is that um, when, we, when you play, when you interact with the data with audio, you just, again, pick out different patterns. And this isn't a crazy idea at all. Like I said, we already used this before in heliophysics 50 years ago as a research tool. And there's fields that use it like almost, we're using it almost exclusively like ornithology and other, other fields. So it's not crazy to use audio um, it's just that we don't do it because we don't have standard techniques um, to do it at this time in, in heliophysics. And I'll just play one example sound of, of the type of UOF waves I was just talking about. You're going to hear about um, five days of data, and this is from a NOAA GOES satellite. So there was that, that kind of brief whistle that kept coming back. That's what the satellite is detecting as it goes round and round the Earth on its orbit. 
and picks out, goes through the same region of space and picks out the same basic whistling tone. You'll get more, a little more about that um, on, a, on a later slide when I'll show um, an example um, from an earlier citizen science project, which is right here, which is kind of leading into this slide. So, so Martin um, Archer, who, who couldn't be here today, um, led a project uh, uh, to use sound uh, to work with high school students in the UK. And um, he was working with many different types of schools and there's a lot of um, uh, good examples of how the students um, that they were working with basically did these exploratory research projects with, in conjunction with Martin and their teacher um, to use audio and other, other techniques to um, basically study um, waves uh, in the heliosphere, in particular near, near a space environment. But what they found um, uh, when they were studying the NOAA GOES satellite data is a very repeatable pattern um, in, in the waves uh, when they listen to about a year's worth of data all at once. This, this idea of comp compressing down one year to about six minutes. And so what they would do is they would use a, a tool called Audacity, which uh, probably a couple of you have used before. It's an open source tool. It's fantastic to do, um, it, uh, to do um, audio processing and to look at data. Um, and they used Audacity along with Excel an Excel spreadsheet that Martin designed to kind of pick out different patterns and record their observations. And so with this technique, um, the high school students picked out this pattern and I'll just play a movie on the next slide that gives you a little more detail on, on what pattern they actually found. So let me go back to the beginning here. So this this is um, that 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 pattern you heard is what the the GOES satellite. This is a NOAA satellite that's orbiting basically at the same altitude around the Earth as it goes around and around and around. And this was a one example of the same pattern they heard over and over again as they listened to this year of data. So over about a week, what you're hearing is this blast of white noise at the beginning, kind of like a crunching, and that's when this the this um, transient in the solar wind, this coronal mass ejection, hits the Earth. And kind of makes everything shake, you know, very in a very complicated way all at once with a lot of energy, and then it quiets down a little bit. And over time, you get this this descending tone every day as the, sat the ghost satellite passes through the region between the Earth and the Sun, and then comes back around and does it again and again and again. And this frequency is decreasing because the plasma environment around the Earth is changing um, due to what's happening during the geomagnetic storm. Basically, the amount of plasma is changing over time. As the as the um, near space environment recovers from this blast of energy from the solar wind, so this is a pattern that they picked out um, very quickly. Over there was I think twenty of them in one year, and before this um, study with the citizen scientists, we thought this kind of thing only happened once in a blue moon. There was like one case study in the literature, and like I said, they picked it out twenty of them. And the reason for that again is because this is the type of pattern that you'll see when you when you listen to data like this and you interact with data in this different way. You know we're really good with compute with the computers at picking out. Let's say I, I can say I want to look for a, a single pitch frequency at this component of the magnetic field, and then it'll pick out like here and here and here. But you won't get this pattern. This white you have the white noise and then the descending tone over many days. So it's that's the kind of complementary thing that you can do with visual and audio analysis. And so the citizen scientists, the high school students, were co-authors on this work, um, and we published it in Space Weather back in uh, 2018. Mike, this is um, fantastic. You're doing a great job. Do you, um, could you go back one slide and just um, introduce us to what's being plotted there? And also, I think I missed why there are two panels. Um, and there's one very good question in the chat. Um, yes, we'll yes, take that. We'll let Jeremy ask that after that. I don't want to give yes. you too many questions for all at once. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for interrupting. That that's great. I didn't even see the chat, so and I, I didn't explain this very well. The, the, yeah, this there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on here. So yeah, what you're looking at first of all, this color, is a spectrogram, a dynamic spectrogram, and um, the way to think about this is kind of like you're reading sheet music. If you're if you're familiar with musical instruments um, and have looked at sheet music before, this would be like the staff where you have um, you'd have like different notes playing, and then um, 
you know, as you if you had a if you had like a note up here, it would be a higher pitch, and if you had a note down here, it would be a lower pitch. So what you're seeing is like, you know, all the notes playing at once. When you see all, so like the, when the color gets brighter or, or darker red, it means like you can think of it like a note is playing, whether you're playing like a wind instrument or a piano or something. And if you have all of the notes playing at once, you just hear kind of you know white noise. But if you have just a, a few notes playing um, at uh, at certain at certain pitches then you'll hear more of a, a specific tone or set of tones. And so that's where you get this kind of whistling thing happening. You know, you see, you see like the notes lighting up in this certain range of pitches or frequencies, and then that changes over days. So this is this, this Y axis here is like pitch. And again, it's like the staff on a, on a sheet music and this X axis is time. And it's again, it's like, if you were playing sheet music over time, you would change the pitch as you, as you move forward. And so this, this panel, is the measurements taken? Um, what what it was is the the GOES satellite, the NOAA GOES satellite, took measurements of the magnetic field, and then we converted them into this format so you could see the different pitches that are contained in that magnetic field measurement over time. And then the reason there's two panels is because there's two GOES satellites. So these are two satellites that are separated in outer space. Um, one goes to the same region of spa space after the other one does over you know a few hours. So they're not they're not all that different, and that's because they're basically going through the same region of space, one after the other. Um, one follows the other after a few hours, basically. So yeah, I don't know if did that get. Yep, go ahead. Perfect uh, for me, uh, and they're both in geosynchronous orbit. I think you, um, yeah. So they're they're way out from the Earth, like what six point six Earth radii out, and they are synced to one place on Earth. So they're going through the magnetosphere sampling these pieces of it um yeah do you are you able to look at the chat jeremy's got a couple of great questions in there yes i am going to look at it right now <laughs> <laughs> um and please do interrupt me like i don't i don't mind at all like i took out some jargon but there's probably a lot more and other stuff that's not yeah not obvious to me but definitely good to ask about so i think i'm trying to find scroll down jeremy's i'm seeing Jeremy's question, could this audio be synced with a visualization of the orbital path and see me wavefront to see the correlation? Path through moving, i.e. path through a moving wavefront of an orbiting spacecraft. Um, I think so. To see the orbital path, I'm just trying to think about this for a second. So, so yes, I mean, well, the first, let me take this in two parts. So yes, absolutely, you could and should um, sync this with the satellite orbit. And in fact, yeah, one of the things that we learned from this work is that it's really useful to visually see where the spacecraft is at the same time these waves are occurring. And that's exactly what we've tried to do with the new NASA project that I'll show you. So we do we do wanna sync these and that's a great, great comment. Um, as far as this, the CME wavefront, um, I think, uh, you you could do that. I mean, so we could we could detect basically for this kind of wave event where you do have the CME interacting with the earth, you could, yeah, totally. I think it would be great to visualize where the CME is and how how much does it compress the, the nearest space environment, the magnetosphere. And you could also look at measurements inside the CME itself if you're lucky enough to have a spacecraft uh, in that region when it's striking. So I think these are all great comments. Um, and, and I will show you an example of how we've synced the spacecraft orbit where the, or where the spacecraft is with the measurements. So definitely a great comment. Um, see if I got any more questions here. Oh, uh, one thing that Laura's question about the same kind of graph they use in Merwin for bird calls. Uh, I'm not sure about Merwin because I just because I don't know it, know it, but I know like soundscapes to landscapes um, use. So, so yes, the short answer is yes, they definitely use this kind of chart in ornithology and looking at bird calls. And um, I know soundscapes to landscapes, another citizen science project from NASA does that. And it's, yeah, it's a great way. It's kind of like we're going in opposite directions. Like, the space physicists use this kind of chart all the time, um, but we never use sound. Whereas the ornithologists were always using, you know, written records of like bird calls and stuff. And they're, they're, they've used this chart more and more recently. Um, so yeah, great, great point there. Uh, and Jeremy has another question. Is the audio spectrum being compressed to human auditory range? Um, yes, it is. Uh, we, I had another chart and I could show it later that actually walks through like how we chose um, 
the, the, there's a couple of knobs you can turn with the audio analysis. You can, you can resample and speed up playback. And yeah, we, we basically turn the knobs such that you could hear these waves because they're, they're way below the human audible range otherwise. Um, does the motion of the spacecraft cause any Doppler effect? Yes, th th that's a great, another great question. The short answer is yes. It's not very significant for this spacecraft, um, but it, that effect can be significant for the Themis spacecraft, um, which I'll talk a little about uh, later um, in the next couple of slides. I don't know if I got all the questions here. And I'm in a, ch I'm in a table, um, Chand Chandrish's, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Chandrish's question on the hearing the auroras until a little later, but that's a great question. And I'll talk a little bit about sound in the aurora at the end. That's a great comment. And I don't know if I hit all of them. Did I hit all of the questions? Did anyone else, uh, please feel free to chime in if you have any other questions or if I miss, missed your question. Okay, I will go on. Um, yeah, so so these are all great questions, and and I think we, um, like I said, some um, some of the questions actually led into this this um this next phase of the citizen science project, like the orbital plots and so on. So we we wanted to build on that effort um, that Martin was leading, and we we went to NASA and um, proposed for a citizen science seed funding grant which we got back in 2021. And the goal was to adapt that methodology with, um, with that Audacity software in Excel to, a, I, won't, I, sh I won't say US audience, it's actually more to, a, um, to, to an international audience because we, made, we, we took that tool that really required you to be there in person in a classroom teaching them about Audacity and Excel and, and put it into a uh, more user-friendly streamlined interface that anyone could use on who, anyone who has a, a, a computer with a, a with an internet browser. So in the last uh, couple of years, we've, we've been beta testing our new tool of citizen scientists, um, particularly high school students and university students. And our GUI is now ready. So I'll, I'll go into, I'll show you a bit about it and, and definitely would love feedback from folks here on, on the GUI and, and would love your help too, to help us look at this data. So in terms of what we're doing with this next phase of the project, um, like I said earlier, this, these waves are, have lots of analogies to musical instruments. And if you think about the waves in the near-earth space environment in the magnetosphere, um, you can think about it like a massive harp. Um, there's these, this analogy with waves on a string. And as you move away from the earth, the magnetic strings get longer and longer. And also you can think of the, the, you know, like if you've ever played guitar or harp or any, any string instrument, the properties of the string itself, like how thick is the string, how dense is the string, that can affect the sound or the pitch that you hear. And so that also changes as you move away from the earth. And so you can basically see in, in satellite data, if you, so, so the satellite we were working with before was basically sitting on one harp string. It was only sitting at the same distance from the earth. But there's other satellites that go in these orbits that go back and forth in an, what we call an elliptical orbit, and they can potentially sample the whole HARP. And that's, um, for example, the Themis satellite that we're going to be working with. And we know um, from these satellite observations from, from past work that you can have situations where the whole HARP is playing all at the same time. You can have situations where only one string is playing, and you can have some kind of weird mixture where um, you know, you just see a bunch of noise basically, or something else like a bunch of noise. And we still don't really understand what conditions can cause these different cases. And so um, this is a big question for us because these waves are really important for impacting space weather and they can affect, they can also affect the aurora, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, so we really wanted to get at this question and that's where we wanted to get help from um, citizen scientists with this bigger data set um, than, than Martin was working with from the NASA's Themis mission. And let me go forward and I'll check the chat in again in a second. But again, this is the link to our website if you want to learn more um, about the science, because I'm probably not going to get to go into too much detail today. But uh, if you go to that website, you can see our GUI. You can sign up to help us um, look for these events, these HARP events, and um, also provide us any feedback you have on our, on our audio and visual analysis tools. Um, so I'm just going to play you a quick demonstration of our graphical user interface with some sound, um, just to give you a sense of how this all works. Um, do that right now. 
So this is like a tutorial. Um, you'll see before you get turned loose on the real data. Um, and you see that this is where the orbit pod is on the left. So you'll box an event and then you'll record some observations and you don't have to record everything, but it's just a, usually just a couple, a couple of clicks. And, um, and yeah, the, the, like I said, there's a, there's a tutorial and th that's kind of going through in this movie right now um, that walks you through like what you're listening to, what you're seeing. And I'll just mention right now, let me go back um, here. What you're what you're seeing actually, and this this is this is not real data. This is just a model output. It's the very first thing we show you in the tutorial before we throw you to the wolves, so to speak, and you see the actual data, um, which I'll show an example of. But um, basically, what you're seeing is uh, like like um, the comment from Jeremy earlier. As the satellite moves around, it it moves to a changing wave environment, and so you'll see that as the satellite moves away from the Earth, it's moving again. Remember, it's moving down to the longer harp strings. And so this pitch is decreasing. So the two charts you're seeing here on the top is the actual magnetic field measurement from the spacecraft um, as it's going over a couple of days of data, three days on every, in, in our case, we're showing three days here um, in, in model world. So this is just magnetic field as a function of time. Uh, so magnetic field on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And then on the bottom is that same kind of spectrogram chart I showed you earlier, where now I've put pitch or frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so this is where the pitch is going down and down and down as the satellite's moving away, getting to these longer and longer harp strings. And then it turns around and it comes back and the pitch goes up and up and up. And then just like on any string instrument, you can get harmonics. So sometimes you'll see two harmonics at the same time or two notes being played at the same time. And you'll get that kind of a richer or, or different timber sound and so you, you also see this in the real data too. And so this is where we kind of start asking people for help to, um, let me see if I can bring up the box, to tell us if they see a pure tone or a mix of tones uh, and, and record their observations, both on the, what they're seeing in the spectra and also what they're hearing in the, in the data. And so that's basically how that works. And I think I'm gonna show you on the next slide. Yeah, let me stop here. Real data, yeah, this is what the real data will look like now. So it's not the nice clean lines you know, that you saw earlier. It's more of a messy pattern, but still you can see the trends. Um, and that's where you'll see, you know, there'll be three lines and you'll can, you can help us basically pick out, you know, when you see the nice clear harp events, um, like a harp and when you see some, some of the more messy events and help us understand, once we have people looking at all these events and picking them out um, and telling us their observations, we'll have a much better idea of when these different cases happen, when you get the, the clear harp event, when you get just one certain frequency playing or multiple frequencies playing, and when you get nothing like the harp at all. And so, so this is really gonna bring, I think the, the power of crowdsourcing and getting help from a lot of people uh, to look at this data. Um, so that we're really excited to, to launch. We're launching on Monday. Um, theoretically, we're launching on Monday. It should be um, sometime around noon Eastern time, I believe. And so, um, uh, but you can always go to the website anytime you have time if you're interested and and sign up uh, for to help us out. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time and if there's any questions. I wanted to talk a little bit about connections with the Aurora. Should I stop here though, or, or am I running low on time and should should jump ahead? Any, any thoughts? Um, yeah, maybe maybe go five more minutes or so, and then we'll we'll see how we're doing with questions. Okay. Get some more questions. Sounds good. Um, so. People here know better than me, of course, that there are waves in the aurora. Um, in fact, I think someone was mentioning in the beginning pulsating aurora. And so there's all kinds of, of um, periodicities in the aurora. And um, these waves that I'm talking about uh, can definitely create aurora, power the aurora, and interact and heat with the upper atmosphere. And I'm just going to play a movie. I mean, there's tons of great movies of, of waves in the aurora, and I, I'm sure you're all familiar with seeing, you can see them directly. The reason I'm showing this one is just because it has a bunch of different periodicities or time scales in the aurora. You can see these really rapid variations. You can also see sort of a longer, you know, like maybe five, if you look at the time on the top, maybe five minutes where you see this fading out and then it's going to come back and intense, kind of intensify everywhere. 
and then it might fade out again. Um, and so this is something that, uh, you know, one, one way that you'll see these kinds of ULF periodicity show up. So again, let me just back up for a second and say that these really big waves that I'm talking about, they have um, like a wave period of, let's say one minute or 10 minutes. So you'll see that kind of, that's the kind of periodicity you might expect when you look in the aurora. And so it's kind of hard to see with your eye unless you're just sitting there looking for a long time. But when you play a movie sped up, it's a little easier to see these. But they also, these waves also, um, you'll see them at the same time as you see these higher frequencies, these, these, these um, shorter periods, they're like the pulsating aurora. So sometimes um, the types of things that are creating the pulsing aurora, aurora are also creating these much larger scale ULF waves that I'm talking about. So you can see them at the same time. And I think um, there's still a lot, of, a lot of open questions as to how these waves can create or interact with the aurora. And so that's where we, um, we think there's a good connection with the aurora research community and Aurorasaurus is like, we're gonna have a lot, a lot of these events that we're seeing in the satellite measurements, you know, like Liz was saying, way out in outer space, like, um, you know, many, many Earth radii away. So we're talking like 100,000 kilometers or 100,000 miles away from the Earth. But the, you know, if you follow magnetic field lines to the, to the ground, this is the same location where you might be seeing the aurora. Um, and there's one very specific type of aurora that has a direct connection with the, the, the um, HARP events that I'm talking about. It's called the field line resonance arcs or FOR arcs. And if you have a camera pointed up at the sky, uh, you'll see these kind of east-west arcs um, across the sky, and they're going to move forward, and they're going to be repeatedly moving forward. You'll see one you know, move forward, it might disappear, and then another one will come behind it, move forward, and they'll just keep doing this over and over again. And that's what you're seeing in this, this particular plot at the top, which is just showing you basically one longitude and then time, and you see these things moving um, towards the pole, and it repeats every few minutes. And so this is another thing we, we would like to know, like do these, these, these um, arcs occur when we're seeing these waves in outer space. And I think more generally, we also wanna know um, what other types of aurora can happen at the same time of these waves. Is there a connection with many types, of, many other types of aurora that, that you all are studying? And so um, that, again, these are all open questions and we wanna uh, work with the, the group here and, and would love um, to make these connections. And the very last thing I'll say back to this point about the sound in the aurora. So I haven't, I was actually just trying to look into that before this talk and I didn't get very far. <laughs> but I know there are reports of people that can hear the aurora and I don't have much to say about that other than I think it would be awesome to have like a microphone co-located with an all sky camera just to kind of test that out. Maybe maybe someone has already done that and I'd love to hear about that. But I, I wanna just make one, one other quick point that you don't necessarily need a microphone to use sound to study the aurora. Um, I think there's an argument to be made for just turning some of these images that you're taking into sound and again, it gets back to this idea that the human auditory system can pick out different patterns that the visual system doesn't always pick out. And the astrophysics community is doing this a lot now. They've been publishing a couple of papers where they've sonified or audified images. And you might think about, for example, how you might do that with an all sky image. You could, you could um, take an analogy with raindrops where you have with different intensities um, playing as you have different pixels light up. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of up to, you all to think about whether this is worthwhile or not, but um, I think it's worth just just maybe playing around with it and seeing if you can see different patterns or hear different patterns than you're seeing and seeing if you can pick out, you know, when you have a lot of stuff going on at the same time, if the audio can help um, to pick out these patterns. So it's something we would love to do in the future to audify ground-based data sets, including all sky imagers. And uh, yeah, it's another great, I think, way to, to work with the uh, Aurora community. And again, I don't know the answer to the question about the sound in the aura um, that someone asked earlier, but I think it's another great thing that would be great, will be very interesting to look at. Um, and that's basically my last slide. Um, I just wanna say again, that we, we, we would um, love to, co to collaborate with the group here. Uh, we're very interested in all the work that you're doing and all the, the cool aurora, wavy aurora that you're uncovering. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to audify both other satellite data and ground-based data sets in the future. And I think I will leave it there and check the chat. But th thank you again for the opportunity to present. It was really fun to listen to the conversation before this started and would love to hear everyone's thoughts on, on um, anything or, or any questions. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, it'll be very exciting to check out these data. Um, seeing a question for your contact info. Um, 
more questions in the chat. Anybody want to come on camera, ask their questions? Um, hopefully you're encouraged to try it as well. I think one really cool thing that you're doing that also has some kind of um, cross-training sort of purpose with um, Aurorasaurus is the way that the data are showed in different ways. You know, this data is out in space. Um, and so it's getting experience with a different kind of data too. Um, yeah, so the field line resonance and um, yeah, it'd be great for people to share this in some of their groups as well. Um, do you wanna go ahead, uh, Mike? Do you have some, some questions? Are you seeing some of the questions? Yes, I'm trying to pour through them now. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great comments on recordings of oral sounds, which again, that's, um, yeah, I didn't get too far with it, but I think uh, Michael has made a comment about some work done in Finland which is great. Yeah, that's also my understanding is that there is some good work being done there, but it hasn't um, maybe sort of risen to the level of acceptance or vetting in the space physics community. So it would be good maybe for us to talk to that researcher and hear more about that, um, definitely. Then I see a question from Wara. Do the strings move affect one another like strings on a musical instrument? Um, uh, yes, you definitely have. Uh, if like, let's say the plasma and magnetic field on this string is moving and vibrating, it definitely can spill over to adjacent strings. So there is communication there. Um, we, we see that um, you'll, you'll do, there are conditions in the solar wind or where you'll tend to pluck the equivalent of like a single Harp string. And then if you just watch over time, you'll see some of that sound energy or that the, the sound weak or vibrations kind of weak to adjacent um, harp strings. So that definitely happens. Um, and then Wiz, you had a question about presentations and yeah, I can definitely do that. Yeah. I think, yeah. Hands-on tools are always fun. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I agree, yep. We definitely want to do that, and um, it's very possible to do that. You know, right now our tools are not super user friendly unless you're a Python programmer. They're open source, so anyone can do it, but um, they're not super user friendly, and we definitely want to make it. We don't want to change that. Um, I will say though, we're trying to work with um, Bobby Candy and others and, and NASA CDA Web. So NASA has an interface for working with NASA satellite data. And there it's a little more user-friendly because you can just kind of click a few boxes and you can turn any satellite measurement into sound. But there's a few, we, we basically were kind of talking to them about different knobs people can turn to, to do that. And I think, yeah, just, I think doing presentations in classrooms is a great idea and we just need to get the, the interface to do that. And it's definitely possible. And I see, oh, I actually see you linked something. So I'll, I'll take a look at that for sure. Um, that would be awesome. Uh, and then could the y-axis of the interface, uh, Jeremy asks, could the y-axis of the interface on the spectrogram be in base two rather than base 10 to easily identify harmonics? Um, yes. And we played around with that in beta testing. Um, and I think the short answer to that is it's definitely possible. And I think in a future iteration, um, we would actually like, uh, do I have it? We would actually like to have a way for people to just, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> We would like to have a way for people to just um, basically change things as they like. So like do base two, base 10, have, have that option and kind of reconfigure on the fly. Because um, what we found when we, we did a public survey of things like, we didn't look at the charts, but we looked at the sounds, like what sound, sound processing methods people preferred. And there are differences in opinion on like, because people have different, um, you know, sensitivities to different frequencies and so on in their ears, uh, there's differences between one person to the next. So people have different preferences on which ways they can 
base pick out the, the pattern that we're looking for. And I think the same is true for visual. I think, um, you know, some people will probably prefer base two and some people might prefer base 10. Um, and uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, and we, we should do that, make that an option. Um, then the harp strings have foot points on the ground at different latitudes. Uh, yes, and I agree with your point was mapping from the satellite, from this harp string to the ground is tricky, definitely. Um, and actually, I think the one thing we wanna do in the future is work with the other satellites like the Van Allen probes, which are more in the inner manusphere and um, where the mapping might be a little bit easier because um, the, the, the magnetic field isn't changing quite as much. And that would be really interesting to look at some of the all sky data, let's say, and like, like I know you, you all work with the group in North Dakota um, or there, and, and there's others who have kind of all sky cameras at sort of the upper Midwest and, you know, uh, Southern Canada. And yeah, then maybe we, it would be a little bit easier to do that. But yeah, mapping is tricky. I agree. Um, I put my contact in the chat. And Chandrish mentions the picket fence along with steep similarities with the FOR. Yeah, I had a question about that for, for anyone. I mean, Wiz or others, what is, are there wave, are there any ideas of connections with with waves in the menu sphere and Steve, or is it all kind of happening in the um, in the upper atmosphere or ionosphere? Or? Um, I would say definitely there are wave connections potentially both in the ionosphere and in the magnetosphere. But Steve, because it's lower latitudes, is kind of more of an inner magnetosphere phenomena. Um, and then I'm not actually too familiar with FLR arcs and whether, you know, there are some kinds of aurora that are in the literature that are actually very hard to see for citizen scientists, um, like black aurora, for instance, like you kind of have to be right under it most of the time in, in Fairbanks. Um, and I'm not sure how common or easy it is to um, observe these FLR arcs. So that's something we can talk more about too. Cool. Uh, oops, sorry. So I'm just looking through if there's any more. Um, Jeremy asks, wonder if people would pattern recognize more readily if there was something akin to auto-tune or mapping to a musical scale rather than strictly frequency mapping. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. Um, and I think there's, again, there's a lot of potential um, there's a lot of potential here to, to play around with those knobs and see if there's different ways of turning the, the measurements into sound. Um, and there is, so we're using audification, which is basically a straight conversion of measurements to sound. You know, there's some things that we do, like we speed up the playback, but basically it's a straight con conversion. But there are other, there's a broader technique called sonification of which audification is one type. And in sonification, you just take, you use an analogy between the measurements and the sound, which is like the raindrops analogy I gave earlier. And yeah, auto-tune um, uh, could be, some, I mean, I, I'm not too familiar with that, but I think there's, what I'm saying basically is there's a lot of flexibility and I think we've barely scratched the surface with all the different ways we can um, use audio to analyze the data. Um, we've done a lot with visual, but we haven't really tried any very much at all with audio, at least in heliophysics. Um, yeah, and please feel free to forward anything to my email. Um, and Wiz asks, can AI also recognize patterns in these data? Um, and yes, I think that we want to work with um, the artificial intelligence community. We talked with um, some, uh, some folks at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, and we, we've talked with others. And I think the short answer is, I think this, this is a great way of, to train the artificial intelligence algorithms um, to, to kind of, because they don't, they, all they have right now is for a training set is the really simple plasma wave identifications, but these kinds of more complex but repeatable patterns that happen during storms, for example, geomagnetic storms, for example, um, if we had a set of those that could be fed into an artificial intelligence algorithm, um, I think, yeah, it would be a great way to do it. So it's very complementary, I think. And, and AI can recognize plasma wave patterns in data. That's definitely true. It's just a matter of getting the right training set, I think. 
Um, and there's some other great comments. Nancy Cooper says, I wonder if the youth program at the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library might be interested in participating in this project. Um, that's a great point. Uh, and I'll, I'll just keep reading. The, uh, the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library builds community and provides equitable access to information and reading materials for Washington students unable to read standard print. Yes, I think absolutely. Um, we uh, want to work with those kinds of communities. And um, to be honest, um, we just didn't have the time to uh, build an interface that um, can work with uh, the blind or low vision community. And um, we want to do that. I think uh, we want to get involved with that community and and uh, really hear what their thoughts are and what their needs are and, and work with them to make something because they can really make, I mean, incredible contributions with um, the analysis of the sound measurements. And um, we, we, we definitely want to work with them is a short answer to that. So thank you for that that comment. Uh, and I will I will try to get in touch with them. And cultural differences, yes. Um, another great comment uh, from Laura. Um, the different musical scales. I think there's a lot we could do with that as well. Um, I think there's a, there's a great, um, yeah, I, I think the short answer is it's a great comment. I think we we want to work with um, these tools and try to develop them to work for different cultural contexts and different communities. And I think um, it's something we, we definitely want to do in the future. And, and start and also just start talking to people now about what, what kinds of things they're interested in hearing about. So if, if anyone has thoughts on that, feel free to shoot me an email and, and yeah, we're happy to to, to, to work on that. And just going through, th and thanks for all these great comments. They're awesome. Uh, just reading through. Thank you, Mike. Um, this has been wonderful and we wish you the best. And um, I'm sure that this is gonna be great for um, people to try out and get really into it. And that's gonna be really exciting. So we'd love to hear more. Um, when you have more results too, um, and people as well, they're always welcome. And we are interested definitely, I think, in the auroral connections. So we'll keep in touch there. I will make a plug for our um, MacGyver session at AGU. That's a place that, um, actually you've probably been there already, but um, a place for you know further discussions of these kinds of things. Um, yeah, uh, does anyone have any final comments or fun things to share? Um, let's see. I was possibly gonna pick on Tony and see if he might mind reintroducing himself and sharing an exciting update. Sure, hello. Yeah, I haven't been here in quite a while. It's um. I joined the ambassador program a few years back, but with like going back to grad school, pandemic work, I just, you know, had to take a little bit of a break. But now I'm back in the field of science. I'm newly on the Moon to Mars team uh, down at Goddard, which is really cool. I just started, I'm still in my like month long training of like all the onboarding stuff. But it's nice to be back in space weather. Glad to hopefully be at more regular meetings now that since they're relevant, I can come to them. <laughs> And yeah, excited and you had a great talk today as well. That was really cool. I loved, um, I worked with, um, I'm blanking on his name, but it was someone up at the CFA who was doing like eclipse work with like, um, to help like people who are blind. Trey, mm -hmm. Trey yeah, I worked with Trey. Mm -hmm. I'm like not with him, but as part of the internship, he was doing like the, the eclipse stuff for like blind people. And that was just really cool. So it was, it was neat to see like, oh, like we're finding even more ways to use like sound and you know, alternative access to science is really cool. Awesome. Thanks, Tony, and congratulations. We are excited that another Aurora Source alumni has become a space weather forecaster. I think the, my account is up to at least four. Um, so, and most of them have come from Millersville University. So shout out to Millersville also, and just excited for you to get to begin um, your career in, in Goddard also. So welcome um, and feel free to tell everybody about our group and all and Mike's project too. So we'll keep passing the word and 
Um, we'll get this video out soon. I think this video is helpful. Um, and then there's going to be a lot of nice press on Monday, kind of the full court press from NASA. Um, does anyone else have any other updates or fun things that they would like to share? We've lost a couple people already, but um, we will save the chat. I think that's Laura's on that. Um, thank you all for uh, bearing with us as we were a little bit um, out and about in the last month, um, but uh, very exciting to have um, such a big storm and so many, a lot of new data to look at, and um, there's a lot more going on from that as well. And we'll see you um, next month with the giant Blu-ray discussion that will be um, hopefully very enjoyable. Um, of interest for folks too. So yeah, thank you and thanks for sharing and encouraging reports as always. And thank you especially to Mike. I really appreciate your uh, presenting today. That was fabulous. And it's and the whole team. And yeah, you have a, a real touch for the analogies and um, yeah. it's really great. So, yep. Thank thanks. you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks thank everyone. You. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 See you.